All right, this is the pre-class video for class number 15. It's the second class on humanism. And the focus of the class is gonna be on Mahatma Gandhi. And I hope um, all of you have heard about Gandhi. He was Martin Luther King's mentor or the one King looked up to. He started a nonviolent resistance movement against the British. Uh, to get them out of India, and it was very successful. It's just that after they left, the Muslims and the Hindus uh, had a big, started a civil war. And so that was when uh, Muslims were driven out of India or driven north and the Hindus, there was this huge migration ex exchange of populations. And um, East Pakistan became um, Bangladesh eventually, and then West Pakistan became Pakistan. But that took another civil war between East and West Pakistan. So um, getting the British out then led to a whole lot of infighting among the indigenous people, but they were sort of set up for it too by the British. So there's no one person to blame. Anyway, Gandhi, by the end of his life, because of all the animosity between Hindus and Muslims, Gandhi actually thought he was a failure, which is unfortunate, but these things happen. And so it is really important, I think for you to understand the stories that you hear. You hear stories of when somebody did something really great, but you don't always get their whole biography and you don't always get what happened before that, what happened after that. Um, you get kind of watershed moments and then you have to sort of figure it out, right? How does that fit in with the whole life? Because that's going to be true of your lives too. You know, you will have your real peak moments or the times when you really succeed at what you aimed at and then there will be these times when you falter and there'll be times when maybe you fail but it's all part of life um so let me start with um i'm gonna let's see what did i i'm gonna start with the bhagavad gita and um, I'm going to start with this part of the outline, pretty much where we left off, which was you're on these different paths. And the students were talking about the path of pleasure. Alexa said she came to Lyon to play soccer, and that's pleasant for her. So she's on the path of pleasure. I think uh, Ryan and um, Tim and others were on the path of success. Often that's true for college students. They're trying to get a foot in the door, trying to succeed so they can have a career. Um, the path of renunciation would be after they uh, succeed and then Lion College comes after them to try and get their money after uh, 20 years, 15 years or so. Um, then they have to be on the path of duty and give us their money. Um, and then there's the path to the infinite within. And so this, the Gandhi story is about how he lived out his social justice ministry activities as one part of the path to God. And that was really important for him. Um, so Gandhi considered himself on the path of action. Um, this one. And he was called the word Mahatma means is a wasn't his literal birth name. It, it's a sacred name. It's a name of honor. He who does the task dictated by duty, caring nothing for the fruit of his action. He is the yogi. Um, this is the idea that Gandhi just did things nonviolently. He didn't do them to calculate you know, the consequences, the outcomes. It's just, this is what you do, and this is how you do it. You stay in touch with the Atman. You don't 
create negative karma. If the people who beat up on you, if people choose to beat up on you, they create negative karma, but you don't fight back and you aren't the aggressor. It's just obvious that you're just trying to harmonize the universe with the truth, which is that we're equal. This oppression of the native Indian people was wrong and unjust, and it just created all this negative karma because it's based on a lie. Now, Gandhi was inspired by the book, the Bhagavad Gita. And um, this video will get way too long if I try to read from it or explain it more than I'm going to. But so the Bhagavad Gita is a very small part of the Vedas. Um, the creation stories were taken from the Hindu Veda. But the main doctrine in this small book is um, that of personal devotion to a supreme God, and then to act, to take your actions from the point of view of devotion to God. You're to act and perform tasks without heeding the transient contingencies, right? You don't worry about the small stuff and you don't worry. If you worry just about being effective, you're not gonna be effective. You just have to worry about doing the right thing. And that will create the karma that will be the most effective. Um, all the rules, the codes of behavior, the rules of sacrifice are less important than the secret teachings, which is the spirit with, with, uh, according to which you act. So Jesus was the same, remember? He rejected the, all the old, the old Testament's laws and regulations in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, it is said, um, do not murder, but I say, don't even be angry at your brother. Don't even look at him. Go make your peace with your brother and then come to, this, to um, the synagogue. It is said, you know, but I say, so Jesus was really into the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter of the law. Well, so is the Gita. Um, it had a lot of rituals and laws and regulations, but it, the Gita says, no, it's the spirit within, according to which you live. That's what matters. So this is a story of Arjuna. And Arjuna, his cousins did some horrible thing, right? They created terrible karma. So his religious duty was for him, his family, to declare war on his cousins. And so in book one, Arjuna is there at the battlefield and he looks and he sees his cousins. He knows this, he knows these people. And he drops his sword and says, I can't do this. I can't kill these people, they're my family. And then Krishna, so it's Vishnu, Remember, there's the Brahman, the Vishnu, and the Shiva. Vishnu is the preserver, the one that keeps coming to earth to sort of redeem the earth and get things back on course. Jesus was an incarnation of Vishnu. I mean, people think that, right? Buddha, uh, Muhammad, they could all be considered incarnations of Vishnu because they're trying to get humanity back on track. So Krishna comes, or Vishnu in the form of Krishna comes, and he says, no, uh, you need to fight, but you need to do it with a right thinking mind. You have to have a different mindset while you're doing it. Um, so there's the contemplative mindset, the yogi, but you have to do this work. So there's the path of God through work. And you have to do it without the, well, still being attached to the jiva within, okay? And kama is the threat. Kama is evil, um, calculating, wanting to murder people. You know, it's greed, it's pride, it's 
um, conquest. It's all that bad stuff. And that's the enemy. And you got to get rid of all that stuff. All your false motives and your um, excess aggression and your brutality and all that. Got to get rid of all that. Um, so then, then there's a section where the incarnation, this is linked to other religions, um, moderation in all things. He talks about that. Well, that sounds like Aristotle and Confucius. And here we go again. And the relation between nature and culture, integrating nature and culture. The Greeks were doing that. Confucius was doing that. And Hindus are doing that. And focusing on the spirit, living for the sake of something greater than yourself, something that lives beyond you. All right. And then I have um, an outline of uh, Rudolf Otto. He, he uh, studied the different world religions. And he said there's these common patterns. And one of them is there's a non-rational element. Um, in its original source and its central core. So the central core is beyond just reasons. It's, it has to do with your heart, but it's also, you know, those drives close to the brainstone where you learn how to take those deepest drives and transform them into something sacred, something dedicated to God. Um, okay, Orthodox Christianity is just focused on uh, doctrine, intellectualizing, but this experience of the holy is a feeling, right? Um, it's the mysterium tremendum. So you feel this. This happened to Arjuna. He, the Brahman, revealed himself to Arjuna, and the whole universe was sort of revealed to him in his mind. And um, he feels dread. He feels like nothing compared to God, who is everything, um, this feeling of being overpowered, um, something that's wholly other, and something that's sort of awe-inspiring. Um, and it's a kind of self-surrender. Now, this is true in, you know, Judaism, Christianity, um, you could say Confucianism, the great harmony, um, if you want to, it's not quite as mystical as that, but, um, and then that's, that's the conversion experience, turning around. It's like a second birth. There's the inward teachings of the spirit. That's the light of your mind, the voice of reason, or the voice of wisdom. Um, okay, now, Here's what happened after 9-11. And the question is, are these men speaking from that inner voice of the holy? Or are they calculating? Are they doctrinal? Are they certain that, you know, they know everything and they know what we should do about it? Um, so why don't you think about that? It's an open question. Billy Graham says, we're getting what we deserve. People ask, how does God allow this? Uh, what can we learn from this? You have to accept that God is sovereign. We each need God, we need each other. And so we should use this occasion to unite and we need a spiritual revival and renewal. Now, Billy Graham is dead, but his son, use 9-11 to gain, to, for, to gain, to increase the size of the Graham empire. And he was on the, he became very arrogant and very sure of himself and very anti-Muslim. Um, and he's very much into power. So I think his father would be very disappointed in him. Um, and then Jerry Falwell also, God allowed this to happen because, uh, because the feminists, the gays, and the humanists were taking over our country. Well, now we have Jerry Falwell Jr., who has been exposed as 
having sex parties at the swimming pool and helping his friends become millionaires by giving them contracts for his school and um, himself making a whole lot of money. So we have to be, I think we ought to be a little bit more humble and careful because these men demonized somebody or, um, I mean, Billy Graham didn't, but still his son took advantage of the moment. So try to keep those things in mind because there are, right? How, who took advantage of the COVID moment and used it to get richer, to get more powerful? And who really tried to deal with this on the other hand? Um, all right, what about bin Laden? He said, I didn't have anything to do with it, but it's punishment from Allah, which makes sense because we've been exploiting the Middle East for their oil forever. I knew we were going to have a 9-11, but nobody asked me because the way we were treating these people, they hated us. And I knew there would be some kind of passive aggressive thing that they would do. Um, then there's this, I quoted, I quoted a bunch of ministers and you can think about these things. Um, that is freedom. It's not God's will. The people who did it freely chose to commit an evil act. And then the Baptist preacher in Texas said, well, we, we should have treated these people better. I mean, we shouldn't support the Israelis and their violent tactics toward the Palestinians. We shouldn't um, keep strong arming the Mideast so we can get cheap oil. Um, but we didn't deserve to be attacked for it, right? That's not the way to solve a problem. Um, all right. So let me go back to the outline. Um, yes. So here are the, um, that's the idea of the holy, his experience of God. The Brahman reveals itself to him. Here are the character traits of a good person in translation, of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, which I think is really interesting. Humbleness. Jesus, Socrates, Confucius, Arjuna, they all have humbleness, truthfulness, harmlessness, know thyself, don't think you know what you don't know, patience, don't get too angry, uh, honor, rational honor, take pride, know that you are doing something that's honorable, even if you aren't honored, but you honor the wise. Um, purity, constancy, self-control, uh, temperance, contempt for, for sense delight, uh, perception of the certitude of ill in birth, death, age, accept what you can't change, um, detachment, don't get too attached to things you can't control, um, keep, uh, accept what you can't control. So change what you can, uh, accept what you can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, okay, so, and you always worship me or you always stay in touch with the Atman. You love solitude, getting back to your center. Here's another list on page 81. Fearlessness, that would be courage, singleness of soul, focus of mind, always strive for wisdom, open hands means generous, and governed appetites, temperate, um, the love of lonely study, so reflection, uh, self-knowledge, humbleness, uprightness, um, truthfulness, slow to wrath, <laughs> Equanimity, equanimity, charity, okay. Tenderness, contented heart. That would be particularly in Jesus, uh, Servant on the Mount, um, a bearing mind, modest heart. So those are all 
they keep repeating themselves through all these traditions. I think the problem isn't the theory. The problem is figuring out when to do each thing, you know, getting angry for the right reason, in the right way, at the right time, toward the right person. <laughs> That's the tough part. All right. So I'm going to spend some time reading about Gandhi's life. And I have a reading here. And I, I present it as a kind of archetype that Jesus and Buddha and uh, well, women, Mary Wollstonecraft, their stories of women, their biographies of, of well-known people. But if you look at the their life stories, all the different phases they went through. It's amazing how a lot of them are very similar patterns. So it's like variations on a theme. Just like every human being has those survival drives that we have to integrate, every human being is born ignorant and dependent. And then they have to go through a long phase of uh, all sorts of developmental stuff before they can be ready to exercise practical wisdom day in and day out. Okay, so he was born, um, he was shy, he was married at age 13, and he and his wife never really quite hit it off because he started out, right, bossing her around. <laughs> and um, that was not good. It didn't get off to a good start. Then, very typically, so parents at that time who were ambitious for their kids, they wanted their kids to be successful, they went to London. He left his wife and son. Buddha did this also. Um, he tried to imitate the British, so he's trying desperately to be Western because he has bought in to the lie that the West is a better culture. Now, it might be more advanced scientifically, doesn't mean it's a better culture. He read the Old and New Testament and especially the Sermon on the Mount, which we read. And then he read the Bhagavad Gita. And, you know, he hadn't read it yet. He was uh, 19, 20 years old before he ever read like you, maybe you hadn't read the Sermon on the Mount. Here you are, 20 years old, and you're reading it for the first time. Um, but it had a tremendous impact, which remained there throughout his life. Um, and that's just remember, you know, what the book does is constantly remind him, just do the path of action, stay on task, stay in touch with the Gita. Um, that's what he was trying to do. Just like if you were Christian and you decided the Sermon on the Mount is it, then purity of heart is your thing. That's what you have to keep working for. Um, all right. Killing was repugnant. Um, and he wanted to, yeah, he, he called it an allegory, right? The struggle between Arjuna and his cousins is really the struggle inside of ourselves between um, being too angry and being not angry enough and being able to hit the mean, being even tempered and eating too much, eating too little and just finding the mean and just eating correctly without any kind of uh, inner strife. So it's about that inner strife that we experience in relation to honor, whether we deserve it, giving other people honor, um, ambition, whether we, you know, what we think we deserve, working hard for something, whether we think we're getting a fair shake, you know, all that stuff can cause a lot of inner turmoil or if you're doing it because you just think this is my way of staying in touch with the jeepa, then you shouldn't be in turmoil. Um, the ideal is action in a just cause without thinking about your advantage. 
just doing it because it's the right thing to do, like Socrates did, even though he got killed, but he didn't worry about that. He worried about not doing anything wrong. Um, okay, hold a like pleasure and pain, gain and loss. Just let that go. Um, and that's the path of action. This is renunci uh, renunciation, like not overreacting and not even reacting really is not indifference, it's very active, actively not getting physically, emotionally engaged in the situation. Having that active emotional disengagement while well, you're still very concerned that you do the right thing. Um, okay, the great souls, um, so, they called Gandhi one of the great souls. Okay, then he went back um, to India. You know, he went to Europe and then he read the Gita. He read the Sermon on the Mount. And then he went back to India and he wasn't a very good lawyer. He was shy. Um, he was floundering, but there were two events in his life that changed his life. First of all, his, his brother, and there's a movie on this called Gandhi, and it's a very good movie, and I recommend that you watch it. I remember this scene. His brother needed legal assistance, and Gandhi comes there with his three-piece suit, and he's so westernized, and he's going to show everybody what a great, you know, what a civilized guy he is. And the British just treat him like dirt, and they're completely racist. And that just didn't sit well with Gandhi, right? He'd read the Sermon on the Mount. He read the Gita. And it's just like, that's a disconnect. These people are not Christians. They're racist and they're classist and they're rotten. <laughs> you know, they're the opposite of what their religion says. So then he was in South Africa and a second episode that he got kicked out of the first class car. He was again up in first class with his wonderful suit on, acting very Western and very elite. He's one of India's elite. And then he got treated like dirt and that was it, right? That was it. So he, he convened a meeting of the Indians in South Africa and he delivered a speech about white discrimination. Again, this is in the movie, and it's very good. And this is a great point. It's always been a mystery to me how people can feel themselves honored by the humiliation of their fellow beings. And so that's false honor. Obviously, that's a corruption of our natural desire for honor and of the fact that human nature is by nature honorable and dignified unless we corrupt it. Um, so then there was a war between the British and the Dutch and Gandhi organized an ambulance corps of Indians to help the British. First, they rejected it, you know, because those are low lives. We don't want to admit we depend on them, but then they needed help. So they, they accepted it. He got involved in raising his children he insisted that he and his wife wash the chamber pots, which is even the chamber pots of the untouchables. And the untouchables job is to, the chamber pots, of course, you go to the bathroom at, in night, at night in your house in a chamber pot, and then the next morning you dump it out. And so he wanted to break all those class barriers and caste barriers and gender barriers. So he was really thinking outside of the box, way ahead of his time. Um, his religion made him political because if you're really gonna stay in touch, you have to be on the path of action. He was, that was his path. And his politics were religious. So you can't go into politics unless you do it with this goal of promoting positive karma. So he had this, this expression, satagraha, which is um, soul force, right? 
it's just true. So he's trying to live the truth, like Jesus, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he's living the truth and he's showing people this is the truth about how to live. Um, then there was a nonviolent resistant movement against this um, racism. It started out with 12 followers and two years later it had 50,000 50, and they did change the laws. And once that happened, um, he wanted to be a reformer of Hinduism uh, he looked beyond national freedom to social liberation. So it wasn't just about getting rid of the British. It was getting rid of all these poisons that separate us, caste, religion. Um, okay. All right. All right, so Gandhi got into village uplift. Um, but in, in World War I, the Indians suffered worse and they expected it after the war to get better, but it didn't, it got worse. So in order to reject this racism and this oppression, they would have these strikes where they wouldn't buy anything. And so all the white owners of the stores were going bankrupt um, and then they started having these resistance movements and there was a massacre. And then there were no, was more nonviolent resistance. I mean, oftentimes we get told the story or we see the scenes from when they're doing it. But look, there was five years with nothing. And then Gandhi began to fast. Um, so he would ask, he would demand something and then he would starve himself until he got what he wanted. And when he became such a holy man, the British couldn't let him die because then there would be like civil war. So they had to appease him, but he just used a very nonviolent technique. Um, then there was hostility, religious-based, class-based hostility. He wanted to get rid of all that stuff. He taught people how to spin their own cloth. So the way the British oppressed the Indians is that they would grow tea in India and then they'd ship it back to Britain and they'd make it into tea bags in their factories. And then they'd sell it back to the Indians for like hundreds of times profit, you know, way more than it was worth. And they did the same with cotton, right? Grow cotton. And then they'd take it to England and they'd manufacture, make it into cloth. And then they'd sell it back. Uh, um, the British did that to the US too. We grew cotton, send it to Britain, make it into clothes, sell it back to us. <laughs> Why can't we make our own clothes? Um, so yeah, this was British colonialism. Um, then, there was World War II. And the thing that was interesting, in the mind of a person from India, supposedly the West was progressive. They had all the science and industry. And supposedly they believed in freedom and equality. Well, then they had those fascist uprisings and movements all through Europe. They were these strong men. So they must have thought, wait a sec, you know. Over and over, they've sold into the fact that they're an inferior culture and the West is superior. And then over and over again, the West does things that makes them think, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so um, here's the salt tax. Um, it's the kind of like the Boston Tea Party is that um, they would get sold uh, salt, right? They would, there's plenty of salt uh, in the Indian Ocean, but the British would process it or whatever and sell it back. So what Gandhi did is he had all these people marching down to the ocean and they had these very flat pans and they put just a little bit of ocean water until the water evaporated. They got a lot of salt. They gathered that, did it again. So they basically made their own salt. 
Um, and uh, 60,000 people got arrested. And here's the story of the massacre at the Salt Works factory. So there was a factory there. Um, and this is how it went, okay? On May 4th, less than a month after he'd become a salt criminal, Gandhi was arrested in the night while sleeping in a tent a few miles from the scene of the crime. Um, several days before his arrest, Gandhi had informed the Viceroy, the head of the British faction, God willing, he would raid the salt works 150 miles north of Bombay. Um, God was not willing, right? He got arrested. But 2,500 volunteers participated. Um, before participating, the leader of it warned the, the demonstrators that they would be beaten. But she said, you must not resist. You must not even raise a hand or ward off a blow. Okay, so Manalal Gandhi, the second son of the Mahatma, advanced at the head of the marchers and approached the great salt pans, which were surrounded by ditches and barbed wire and guarded by 400 Surat policemen under the command of six British officers. So you have to picture this. This is a way to oppress people. You don't have the, the British directly beating up the demonstrators. What you do is you hire a number of native police officers and you give them a way higher standard of living than they would otherwise have. And then they are the ones that have to beat their own people. If they don't, they're back on the street. If they do, they have a nice comfortable job. But of course, they're not advancing their own society. They're on the side of the British. Okay, so in complete silence, the Gandhi men drew up and halted 100 yards from the stockade. So if you look at the movie, there's like 25 people lined up and they're gonna go down in this ditch and over to the, the fence um, that surrounds the factory because it's symbolic, you know, it's symbolic. I've been in demonstrations like this before. I never tried to climb the fence and I never ended up in jail, but that's how it works. <laughs> Some other people did. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Suddenly at a word of command. Okay. So the the 25 are walking down the ditch and over. Suddenly, at a word of command, scores of native policemen rushed upon the advanced marchers and rain blows on their heads with their steel shod um, clubs, right? These clubs have steel in them. Not one of the marchers raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like 10 pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening whack of the clubs on unprotected skulls. The waiting crowd of marchers groaned and sucked in their breath in sympathetic pain at every blow. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious or writhing with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. The survivors without breaking ranks silently and doggedly marched on until they were struck down. When the first column was laid low, another column, so 25, then another 25. Um, let's see, although everybody knew that within a few minutes he would be beaten down, perhaps killed, I could detect no sign of wavering or fear. They marched steadily with their heads up without the encouragement of music or cheering or any possibility that they might escape injury or death. The police rushed out and methodically and mechanically beat down the second column. There was no fight, no struggle. The marchers simply walked forward until they were struck down. Another group of 25 advanced. The police commenced savagely kicking the seated men in the abdomen and the testicles. Another column presented itself. 
Enraged, the police drag them by their arms and feet and threw them into the ditches. Um, another policeman dragged a Gandhi man to the ditch, threw him in, and belabored over him, him over the head. Hour, okay, hour after hour, the stretcher bearers, stretch, stretcher bearers carried back a stream of inert, bleeding men. Um, the raids and beatings continued for several days, all right? Day after day, hour after hour, they peacefully demonstrated, got beaten up, killed, you name it. Okay, India was now free. Legally, technically, nothing had changed. India was still a British colony, but there was a difference. Europe had completely lost her formal moral prestige in Asia. She's no longer regarded as the champion throughout the world of fair dealing and the exponent of high principle, but as the upholder of Western race supremacy and the exploiter of those outside her own borders. For Europe, this is an actual fact, a great moral defeat. Even though Asia is physically weak and unable to protect herself from aggression where her vital interests are menaced, nevertheless, she can now afford to look down on Europe where before she looked up. The salt march and its aftermath did two things. It gave the Indians the conviction they could lift the foreign yoke from their shoulders and it made the British aware that they were subjugating India. It was inevitable after 1930 that India would someday refuse to be ruled and more important that England would someday refuse to rule. When the Indians allowed themselves to be beaten with batons and rifle butts, but did not cringe, they showed that England was powerless and India was invincible, the rest was merely a matter of time. So the story there is that the human spirit is powerful. And if you really do engage in spiritual um, activism, you can make a difference. It makes a difference. They're turning points in history. Um, the next thing was as Gandhi and his movement gained ground. They, they, uh, the prime minister, there was a big conference where Gandhi was going to meet the viceroy, which is the main, um, the head of the British occupational force in India. There was a round table conference attended by Indians. Um, met in London in November 1930. It came to nothing because the only popular organization in India, the Congress, was not represented. So they don't invite the people who represent the Indian people. So it's not going to matter. Okay, then there was another conference. It was more than dramatic. It was historic and decisive. Winston Churchill saw this better than anyone. He was revolted, he declared, by, quote, the nauseating and humiliating spectacle of this one-time inner temple lawyer, now a seditious religious leader, striding half naked up the steps of the viceroy's palace, there to negotiate on equal terms with the representative of the king emperor. So, you know, we hear about Churchill as being a great leader of the British during the bombings in World War II, but he was racist. He was incredibly racist. And, you know, I didn't hear about that until I read some of these books. So, you know, just try to remember the education you get is brainwashing. It really gives one very small perspective on what actually has happened in the past and on these iconic figures of the past 
There's nothing wrong with finding out what they were really like. And they had these blindnesses and we don't have those, but we have our own blindnesses. So we can be critical of them. And then we should also be critical of ourselves. Churchill's anger and contempt, undisguised and ferocious, did not blur his vision. He grasped the basic fact which was not the state of the Mahatma's undress or his discarded profession, but the equality he had acquired and was asserting with the Viceroy. Gandhi had not come, like most of the other Viceroy's visitors, to petition for favors. He came as the leader of a nation to negotiate on equal terms with the representative of another nation. But there's, okay. Then, um, still, the British government had no intention of giving India freedom, independence, dominion status, or even lesser rights. Winston Churchill was prime minister, and he was always guided by his famous dictum, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside at the liquidation of the British Empire. He detested, probably feared, Gandhi. Um, who, okay, Gandhiism and all it stands for must ultimately be grappled with and finally crushed, he said in 1935. My goodness. Churchill fought the Second World War to preserve the heritage of Britain. Would he allow Gandhi to rob her of that heritage? We mean to hold our own, Churchill said. India was England's property. He refused to relinquish it. From the time he became the king's first minister in 1940 to the day in 1945 when he was ousted, he waged war with Mahatma Gandhi. All right, so eventually <laughs> India got its independence, which again, this, that's colonialism. And we live in a post-colonial world where these former colonized countries are speaking out and they're developing their own culture and philosophy, history. And um, I'm glad about it, frankly. Okay, so the second part of this, that's uh, Gandhi's activism. But the next part of the presentation is about his theology, right? Um, what did he think about God? So the word satya means truth. Um, it also denotes God. Therefore, truth is God, and God is that which is. He alone is, Gandhi noted, for nothing else I see merely through the senses can or will persist. So Gandhi, you know, has this eye of the soul. Everything is the Brahman. Everything is God. Over the years, he tried to prove the existence of God. It's possible to reason out the existence of God to a limited extent. There's an orderliness in the universe. There's an unalterable law govern everything and every being that exists. It's not a blind law, for no blind law can govern the conduct of human beings. The law, then, which governs all life is God. I do dimly perceive that while everything around me is ever changing, ever dying, there's an underlying all that change, a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. In the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence, I gather that God is life, truth, and love. He is love. Gandhi, God preoccupied Gandhi, but he never had a mystic experience. He never heard a voice or saw a vision or had some recognized experience of God like Arjuna did um, and like Paul did and like Jesus did. <laughs> Although non-Indian mystics eager to pin their mysticism to a fixed point occasionally attach themselves to Gandhi, um, 
He was not a mystic and disclaimed being one. I have no special revelation of God's will. He reveals himself daily to every human being, but we shut our ears to the still small voice. God never appears to you in person, but in action. So Gandhi is definitely on the path of action. Um, Gandhi undertook a fast until death on the issue of the untouchables because he wanted to get rid of that um, legal status of the untouchables and the way they were treated, what was allowed, what was forced. Um, now, the, another issue Gandhi had was with the Brahmins, the Hindu Brahmins who were the official religious leaders. So great was their power that they established themselves at the, as the highest caste, higher than the rulers and warriors, because they were able to give the caste gradations a guarantee of stability by hallowing them with the mantle of religion. So the religious folk, I mean, the political leaders depended on the religious leaders to validate the status of the untouchables, the status of all the people in every caste. And that political leaders wanted that because they were given the ultimate, the highest power. And so they hid behind the religious leaders. They were in cahoots with the religious leaders. Um, they clothed caste in a sacred formula of immutable fate. You are a Brahmin or untouchable because of your conduct in a previous incarnation. So your caste rank is preordained for this life. Everybody must submit. But if you're a good little untouchable or a good little whatever, um, you can get promoted after in the next incarnation. So now religion is used as an opiate, a drug to prevent people from rebelling, from believing that they're equal and um, demanding equal treatment. Um, all right. So, and then finally, he says, always tolerant and fair-minded, Gandhi doubted that only the sacred Hindu Vedas were the revealed word of God. Why not the Bible and the Quran? he asked. He recoiled from rivalry between religions, of course. Um, God uses many instruments, and he may have used uh, Mahatma Gandhi to Christianize unchristian Christianity. This is Dr. Stanley Jones. In other words, Gandhi showed Christians what it really means to be a Christian. And by doing so, he exposed the hypocrisy of, of most Christians. Um, in South Africa, for a moment, Gandhi thought of becoming a Christian, but there were questions that he had, didn't have any answers to. Why, he asked the Christians who were trying to convert him, did God have only one son? If he had one, why not another? In Hinduism, there have always been a number of human incarnations of the Almighty. Why can I go to heaven and attain salvation only as a Christian? Was heaven reserved for Christians? Was God a Christian? <laughs> I do believe that in the other world, there are neither Hindus nor Christians nor Muslims. In these seminars, Gandhi occasionally chided the missionaries for making Christians of hungry Indians whom they fed and of sick, sick Indians whom they healed, right? <laughs> if you convert, I'll feed you, or, you know, it's a bribe. Make us better Hindus, he pleaded. Um, Gandhi could have converted many Christians to Hinduism, but he didn't want to. In the end, he embraced Christ, but rejected Christianity. He formulated his attitude um, when he said, I, if then I had to face only the Sermon on my, the Mount and my own interpretation, I should not hesitate to say, oh yes, I'm a Christian. But negatively, I can tell you that much of what passes as Christianity is a negation of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'm not speaking at the present moment of Christian conduct. I'm speaking of Christian belief and Christianity as it's understood in the West. 
And so, yeah, that's what I've been saying, basically. If you follow the Sermon on the Mount, you're okay, but that doesn't <laughs> mean there's a lot of other religious traditions that actually teach the same teachings. So it's not exclusive. There's nothing in the teachings that would force you to be Christian as opposed to some other religion, because it all comes down to your virtue, to the way you live. <clears throat> now, I picked out some quotes. This is the main reading, was Gandhi and the One-Eyed Giant. This is something written by his, I think, grandson um, after 9-11. Oops. And I have some <clears throat> quotes I picked out. I think they're here. Um, yeah. Here's the main things that I want to talk about, but you you read it. Gandhi and the One-Eyed Giants, like a 14-page text. And um, so the need to integrate ancient wisdom and modern science. One of the great lessons of his life was through the spiritual traditions of the West, he discovered his Indian heritage. I was talking to a student about that yesterday, that sometimes you have to study a different religion in order to really pick out what the essence of your own religion is. Um, and when he, when he tried to be Western, he realized the value of his own heritage. Uh, in this faithfulness to his own heritage, he was able to show men of the West a way to recover their own right mind so they could find really what's the essence behind Christianity which is a Sermon on the Mount, these basic values. He realized that people of India were awakening in him. They would look at him and they would think, this was similar to when Confucius said, keeps remembering the good old days of the golden age of China. And people would look at Confucius and try to remember this gold. I mean, they would try to um, live it, right? They would imitate him and he's remembering what China really is. Okay, so Gandhi is remembering what Hinduism really is and what the Indian culture really is. And he's representing it and he's triggering something in the minds of the people. So he's a spiritual leader or he's a leader that leads through the spirit. Um, let's see, spiritual life is the life of everyone manifesting itself, right? Because the deeper down you go, the more similar we are. All the political acts were also spiritual and religious in fulfillment of his dharma, his duty. Just like Arjuna had his duty to kill his cousins, to regain positive karma, Gandhi has this duty to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience to get the British out of India and um, become themselves. The greatest spiritual need is the need to be delivered from evil. Um, sin is already a punishment because it separates you from yourself, your deepest self, your happiness. Um, only your ad admission of defeat and fallibility, only when you admit that you too are fallible, does it make it possible for you to be merciful to others. Um, being merciful is very different than being sort of patronizing or, you know, oh, you know, I don't do things like that, but, you know, I feel sorry for you. Or being self-righteous, like, how can you do that? I would never do that. Those are all really poisonous attitudes. Um, you have to understand, I could do this. I have done this. I can be merciful to anyone who, in a critical moment, makes the wrong choice because I can understand it. So the fabric of society is always being woven. That's why I say we live in a very polarized moment. You can weave society together any way you want. Like you can be part of the polarization. You can be part of weaving it back together. You just have to make choices. Every choice you make makes a difference. Every th thought you have makes a difference. Um, and you have to uh, 
You can't ignore the presence of evil around you and within you. You can't be naive. Jesus was not naive. Gandhi was not naive. But they still did the right thing. Um, all right. He wants, what is a mature political consciousness? Um, we have to regulate our life by the eternal law of love. Martin Luther King talked about that. Um, okay. You don't cooperate with things that are humiliating. Um, gaining self-respect by humiliating other people? No. <laughs> And the atom bomb will never bring in peace. Atom bombs are not peacekeepers or peacemakers. <laughs> um, it gets sold that way, incidentally. Um, so, and I don't think giving everyone in the country an AK-47 is going to make us safer. Um, I just, that statistically, that is not true, right? The data does not bear that out. Um, I had a student, just to give you one example, who said that her grandmother was diagnosed paranoid after 9-11. She just thinks everyone's out to get her, especially Muslims. And she, now she carries around a gun, right? I don't think I'm safer or anybody else is safer because a paranoid one older woman has a gun that if she decides you're out to get her, she could use, right? So um, I just, right now we're in this moment where we seem to think violence solves problems. And I don't think that's the evidence, but at least I'll give you this history of nonviolent resistance as the only way. And we do have this big debate going on. We had Black Lives Matter. We have the backlash. We have all the gun issues. We have all the shootings. And um, you're going to have to make sense out of it because it is affecting your life and it will continue to affect your life. The policies that we have have ripple effects. So doing the research on what actually works, and that's difficult because you're gonna be able to find research on both sides. But um, this, the story of Gandhi is the story of the power of nonviolent spiritual action, that it does have ramifications. Um, there is a book by Erica Chenoweth where she studied all the nonviolent civil disobedience movements and compared them to all the violent civil wars. And 10 years afterwards, what the result was, and actually the nonviolent ones led to a better society 10 years down the road, right? It's not right away that it happens, it's over time that it happens. Um, but then things happen again, and um, history, history is complicated, but this is for you to think about. All right, I'll see you next time. That was a long lesson, um, but I will see you in class, and I will stop the recording here.